For most of the last 30 years, we've been involved with the Afghan story. We've been engaged with what is referred to as the triumphalist narrative of American foreign policy. Simply put, that narrative begins with the US backing, quote, fiercely religious freedom fighters to repel a Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which resulted in a glorious victory over the evil empire, which a short time later caused the Soviet Union to collapse and was immediately followed by the spread of free market capitalism to nations formerly enslaved by socialism. For some time now, we have been drawn to the wartime psychology behind this narrative and how it is that despite the death of communism and its replacement with Islam, the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Towers and the vastly altered circumstances brought on by 9-11, this narrative continues to remain as the operational truth underlying American foreign and military policy towards Afghanistan. When the Trade Towers exploded and vaporized 10 years ago, it was as if a hypnotic moment occurred. It was as if some invisible dark force had reached out and instilled an Old Testament primeval hysteria onto the American mind. The destruction seemed to defy gravity itself as 200,000 tons of steel fell so freely and effortlessly to the ground below, it resembled a controlled demolition. This was no simple Pearl Harbor. This was a more devastating act of psychological warfare than any military strike could ever have accomplished. From 10 years on, everything about 9-11 seems otherworldly and irrational. The reasons for it, the apparent helplessness in the face of it, the curious identities of the people involved, and the American government's irrational response to it. It defied logic then, and it still does. As a Rockefeller family project, the creation of the World Trade Towers had been steeped in psychological symbolism from their start in the early 1960s. The Twin Towers were Rockefeller brothers David and Nelson's symbols of power. As metaphor, the towers were more than just two of the tallest buildings in the world. It might be said they were as important as the two pillars, Joachim and Boaz, which stood at the entrance to Solomon's temple, mystical gates to a cathedral of wisdom in which all could worship under one religion, the religion of business, capitalism. The Rockefellers were no strangers to psychological warfare and its, imp and its impact on American public opinion. During World War II, Nelson headed the US government's intelligence agency for Latin America, the coordinator of Inter-American Inter Affairs, the CIAA. In 1954, Nelson was appointed as President Eisenhower's White House Special Assistant on Cold War Tactics and Psychological Warfare. Nelson Rockefeller played a central role in formulating domestic propaganda programs throughout the 1950s as chairman of the Planning Coordination Group, which in addition to its propaganda work, oversaw all CIA covert operations. His 1956 special studies project, directed by Rockefeller protege Henry Kissinger, produced many of the domestic policy recommendations that came to be known as President Kennedy's New Frontier. Rockefeller aided British intelligence during World War II when he rented space in Rockefeller Center at a steep discount to a number of British propaganda agencies, including their secret intelligence service for the Americas, the British Security Coordination, otherwise known as the BSC. The BSC set up shop in New York City with the help of some of New York's wealthiest families with one main objective, get the United States into the war in Europe on Britain's behalf. One key agent in the psychological war for American public opinion was young RAF pilot Roald Dahl, who along with James Bond creator Ian Fleming, playwright Noel Coward, and Gallup pollster David Ogilvy were given free reign to commit sabotage, political subversion, and propagandize Americans through whatever means possible. Dahl's fiction earned him praise from the New York Times and publishing contracts from Random House, as well as entree to Hollywood, where he would collaborate with Walt Disney in wartime propaganda films. He would go on to become a Hollywood icon with perennial successes like Willy Wonka and The Chocolate Factory. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, CIA propaganda would become so blended into every aspect of publishing, television, and film, CIA insiders would joke that they worked at The Chocolate Factory. The British security coordination would succeed in crafting an Anglo-centric cultural narrative in the public's mind whose main objective was the promotion of a British agenda for the United States. That agenda would quickly shift from anti-fascist to aggressive Cold War anti-communist as World War II ended, with Britain playing a seminal role in the creation of America's national security state in the image of their empire. President Harry Truman's 1947 speech initiating the Cold War fundamentally altered America's identity by embedding a permanent psychology of fear. 
But a hidden aspect of this conflict was the slow, grinding corruption that its unreality fostered in America's leadership. That unreality was finally revealed in the catastrophe of Vietnam. In a remarkably self-effacing 1972 New Yorker article tracing the origins of the devastation caused by Vietnam, titled Reflections in Thrall to Fear, Senator J. William Fulbright bemoaned the mental corruption caused by the Truman Doctrine during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, whereby, quote, our leaders became liberated from the normal rules of evidence and inference when it came to dealing with communism. The effect of the anti-communist ideology was to spare us the task of taking cognizance of the specific facts of specific situations. Our faith liberated us, like the believers of old, from the requirements of empirical thinking. Like medieval theologians, we had a philosophy that explained everything to us in advance, and everything that did not fit could be readily identified as a fraud or a lie or an illusion." End of quote. What Fulbright's tragic reflections fail to include is that America's assumptions about the Cold War were never empirical. In fact, the assumptions weren't even American at all, but were rooted in messianic 19th century British designs for control of the Eurasian landmass. A recent release of classified documents reveals that Britain's wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill was obsessed with Eurasian conquest. His famous Iron Curtain speech of 1946 would establish the idea while framing the ideological narrative by which all future US-Soviet relations would be defined. The inspiration for Churchill's speech <clears throat> and its warning of the growing communist threat to, quote, Christian civilization was James Burnham. As the godfather of neoconservatism, Burnham would work his way from Bolshevik revolutionary Leon Trotsky in the 1930s to authoring a book that would forge the foundations of a new kind of planned, centralized society to the Office of Strategic Services during World War II. His landmark 1940, The Managerial Revolution, would be read and admired by Hitler's general staff and viewed as the blueprint for George Orwell's 1984, in which a new class of business executives, technicians, bureaucrats, and soldiers would destroy the old capitalist order, crush the working class, and seize all of society's wealth for themselves. In a 1945 Partisan Review article titled Lenin's Heir, Burnham, while still at the OSS, infused his apocalyptic political views with mystical allusions to the Eurasian heartland as the, quote, magnetic core of Soviet power, which would descend towards its ultimate destination beyond the Eurasian boundaries and through, quote, appeasement and infiltration, England and the United States. Burnham was a keen advocate of dirty tricks. He would play an important role in the overthrow of Iran's Mohammad Mossadegh and the installation of the Shah. His book, The Machiavellians, would become a handbook for CIA planners. As an anti-communist ideology, Burnham's apocalyptic warnings about the inevitability of Soviet expansion from Eurasia's magnetic core ring like a medieval theologian's incantation throughout Churchill's Iron Curtain speech. George Orwell even made clear in a 1946 critique of Burnham's work that Burnham's words read like a mystical incantation and were most likely intended to hypnotize. Senator Fulbright realized that only because of the disastrous outcome of Vietnam was there any willingness at all to re-examine the basic assumptions of American post-war policy toward the Soviet Union and what had brought the United States to such a sorry state. The 1972 Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, SALT, would, bring, uh, would spring from this realization, as would the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, ABM, and eventually SALT II, until, in January of 1980, President Jimmy Carter would ask the Senate to delay consideration of the treaty on the Senate floor because of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. That treaty would never be passed. Our involvement in the Afghan story began in the summer of 1979 when we began production of a documentary titled Arms Race and the Economy, A Delicate Balance. During the next months, numerous experts, including economist John Kenneth Galbraith, lent their experience to our understanding of the unseen damage that a massive new diversion of tax dollars and investment capital would represent to the civilian economy. Galbraith insisted that renewing the Cold War, as the neoconservative right was demanding at that critical moment, would ultimately destroy the civilian economy. He was convinced that the Cold War had already made America more and more like the Soviet Union, ruled by a military, industrial, academic establishment suspended from reality. 
But by the time our program aired that winter, the argument was no longer whether our government should call a halt to the nuclear arms race and reinvest in the civilian economy. The December 27, 1979 Soviet invasion of Afghanistan had rolled back the narrative to 1947, to the Truman Doctrine, to Churchill and Burnham's mystical medieval enchantment, and the psychological warfare campaign necessary to bring it back to life was about to begin. J. William Fulbright's 1972 Reflections in Thrall to Fear represented an awakening from the deep hypnotic trance imposed upon Americans by Cold War ideology. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan brought about its re-immersion, but this time to a deeper and totally detached level of unreality. With the election of Ronald Reagan in the fall of 1980, the United States not only rejected Fulbright's concerns for the intellectual dishonesty represented by the continuation of the Cold War, but willfully embraced the fraud, the lie, and the illusion as its own and was willing to take it one step further. The U.S. had silently, almost imperceptibly, crossed through a mirror in 1947 with the creation of a second and covert national security government. But few in Washington understood at the time the Faustian bargain they were signing on to as America sh uh, came to shed its own identity and redefine itself in opposition to its enemy. Now that secret government would go deeper into a mirrored image of itself with the help of a two-dimensional Hollywood invention named Ronald Reagan as the host. America would never be the same. As an actor, Reagan had been implanted into America's subconscious as a hero during the 1940s, and his militaristic campaign of peace through strength was hypnotically sold to Americans as the Reagan Revolution. It was, in fact, a counter-revolution engineered by a reactionary gang of Wall Street insiders headed by former Research Industry of America employee, OSS veteran and Wall Street lawyer William J. Casey with the intention of putting America back into a Cold War trance. As Reagan's intelligence chief, Casey had key access to the concentric circles of international power necessary to carry off the shift of wealth from Main Street to Wall Street that we now live with today. Casey took his crusade for freedom and a one-world religion of capitalism deep into the heart of his archenemy. As director of central intelligence, he was perfectly positioned to put James Burnham's dirty tricks and Machiavellian philosophy to work in the heartland of Eurasia. Casey's passion for the Afghan Jihad was messianic. Disguised as a war to liberate Afghanistan from Soviet aggression, Casey's campaign was actually intended to infiltrate covert teams beyond Afghanistan into the Soviet Union's Muslim provinces and provoke an insurrection. Backed by neoconservatives, the Saudis, and secretive organizations like the Safari Club, Le Cirque, the Bilderberg Group, and the Six I, it would play out in propaganda from Rambo to Charlie Wilson's war as the greatest American victory of the Cold War. In reality, Casey's team would so tear down the wall between fact and fiction, legal and illegal, truth and lie, it would make 9-11 inevitable. So how does this conflicting and contradictory narrative affect the US effort in Afghanistan today? In order to understand our perspective on the origins of the problem, we'd like to take you back to our first involvement with Afghanistan in a very short video and, now, and how we came to see the narrative as it was being written. I was in Moscow in October, and a Soviet friend of mine spent several days trying to get a hold of me, and when he did, he then said, how do we get out of Afghanistan? And I said, that's the last question I expected you asked. Well, I, no one can know what the Soviet Union is going to do. Uh, we can fight the war politically and militarily. The way to influence the Soviet Union is to come up and give them a choice, give them a chance to get out, give them a chance for a neutral, non-aligned, Afghanistan, which is not an anti-Soviet government, not a pro-Soviet government, but one which will have no military bases on either side. Uh, the UN is working on that. They're going back to Geneva in June. I talked with the, yesterday in New York, with both Pakistan and Afghan ambassadors and with UN officials. I think there's a fair chance. No one can be sure. And I don't think the Soviet Union themselves know exactly what they're going to do. But we ought to construct and see if we can develop an option that serves them up, a uh, golden bridge, eh? Needless to say, the golden bridge was never offered because Charlie Wilson's war was gaining political traction as a vindication for Vietnam and a justification for Reagan's World War II-sized arms buildup. So what was Charlie Wilson thinking when he pushed the billion dollar program to arm and train fundamentalist factions when the Soviets really wanted to get out, at least as early as 1982? Okay. It was up that if we could get the Soviets sophisticated to 
be able to at least destroy the Soviet tanks and to be able to, to defend themselves against the Soviet helicopter gunships that they conceivably could drive the Soviets from their land. It was a great 10 years. It was a great 10 years for Charlie Wilson, but a bad 30 years for the Afghan people and American journalism. Because hardly anyone realizes today that the biggest mistake of all had been the charade to simply ignore Soviet efforts to leave Afghanistan while claiming that Charlie Wilson's war was being waged to drive them out.